using nature's own engines through natural climate solutions. And uh, Dr. Joe Fargioni and many, many others who have teamed up with him have developed, um, entire teams of scientists have developed methods of literally drawing down um, atmospheric carbon and sequestering it. And these methods involve restoring nature's own functions because we, of course, know that nature has a carbon cycle. And so to restore this carbon cycle, in effect, you have to restore the engines, which are the soils. So by farming differently, doing a replantation of, of forest areas that have been cut, um, by uh, managing prairie lands and rangelands differently, restoring wetlands and mangroves, all of that can help draw down carbon. And the, at least on paper, the potential is enormous to help stabilize and then recover the climate system. But there's a huge implementation gap, so to speak. In other words, the scientists have worked very hard to finding the potential, but it is not happening on the ground at a big level, at a really big scale needed. To do this, to literally save the climate system, we have to jumpstart these practices globally, worldwide, not just in one region or one pilot project here and there, but everywhere. And so we have to have this almost waking up effort globally to restore nature. And this can um, lead to huge co-benefits for communities, local communities in enhanced food supply, enhanced wildlife habitat, it can help solve the biodiversity crisis. Um, it can provide flood control, all sorts of co-benefits. Um, but to close the implementation gap, we have to have a couple of things. First of all, we have to focus on the regional level in terms of planning. Um, we need atmospheric recovery plans, so to speak, that plan this out and get the stakeholders together to really create a vision regionally and then implement it. So at University of Oregon, we have an interdisciplinary team actually working on how those processes might be structured. But the second thing is we need to offer financing to working, land, working lands managers, to the um, farmers and ranchers and foresters and wetlands resource. We need massive financing to jumpstart this restoration effort. And where does that financing come from? Um, this is very analogous, this process or this challenge is now analogous to cleaning up an oil spill in a marine area. When an oil spill happens, the fossil fuel companies that are responsible for the product that's spilled um, are responsible for paying for the cleanup. And so what we analogize this to is um, sort of an oil spill in the ocean. It's, it's our oil spill in the, in the sky. We're talking about financing a sky cleanup. The models exist for cleaning up hazardous waste. And we draw on those models in constructing the theory that can then um, move atmospheric recovery litigation, as we call it, into the courts. Um, the theory is premised just simply on the cleanup structure that public trustees or sovereign governments use to finance cleanup of polluted public resources. And so whenever there is a, a, an oil spill, uh, for example, in, in a waterway, um, governments as public trustees are authorized to sue the polluters to force the cleanup or force financing of the cleanup. So who could sue? The governments as trustees would be federal agencies, unlikely in this administration, states, counties, um, perhaps cities as agencies of the state sovereigns and absolutely tribes as sovereign nations and also other uh, nations internationally. Those are the, the um, trustees position to sue. The liable parties are the carbon majors. Those have been identified um, in a, a groundbreaking study by Rick Heady. Um, and these are the, the parties that are responsible for most of the carbon pollution since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And um, as has often been said, you can fit those parties on a school bus. There's not that many of them. Now, the cleanup money would come to some institution, I call it a sky trust, to disperse on a regional level to pay local farmers, ranchers, foresters, 
um, tribal people, restoration crews, um, all of those, um, if, they, if they want to engage in restoration work. The claims, the claims that could be brought in court against the polluters um, are not statutory claims because there is no statute that allows natural resource damage recovery for the atmosphere. There should be, but there's not yet. Um, as as uh, Alan Canner has written prolifically, you don't need statutory claims to bring natural resource damage actions. In fact, there are a whole set, there's a whole set of common law claims that can be brought to pursue natural resource damages. And so these suits are very much analogous to ones proceeding right now in the courts that we've looked to in our scholarship. And there's three major categories of suits right now claiming natural resource damages under common law theories. Uh, one set of suits is the PCB litigation against Monsanto and others, um, uh, uh, trying to get damages to clean up waterways and soils that have been polluted by PCBs. Another is the MTBE suits, which, um, which go after polluters for groundwater contamination. And the third is the PFAS, which is very, very new. Um, all of these are suits brought by trustees against polluters for restoring public resources. Now, many of these are not called natural resource damage lawsuits, but in our minds, they really are those because no matter what they're called, they're using legal claims um, on behalf of a trustee to get money from a polluter to clean up damaged public resources. And that is the essence of a natural resource damage claim, whether or not it's so labeled. Many of these have been very successful and the other panelists will demonstrate, um, will explain where they've met with success, where they haven't, and give us some insights into that. I should say that the analogy to these cases is very clear, but there's another set of cases which um, involve uh, claims brought on behalf of municipalities or states in some cases um, against uh, fossil fuel polluters for climate damages. Those are less analogous if they are just seeking adaptation damages. In other words, many of those seek to pay for new uh, seawalls or damages for relocation um, and such. Those are not so analogous to what we're talking about in, in some ways, because although they sue the same parties, they are not suing to actually recover the atmosphere's climate system. They are suing to recover other forms of damages that really don't do anything to solve the problem, but they address the harm that climate has created. Now, there's not enough money in the world, and there never will be, to pay for all the damage this fossil fuel industry has unleashed on this world. And so we're dealing with monetary resources. And uh, we've all heard about the fossil fuel industry right now um, and how it is, um, it is tanking. But in any event, there's not gonna be enough money to pay for all of it. And so this atmospheric recovery litigation says, with limited resources, pay to help fix the problem first by cleaning up the atmosphere that's causing all the damages to virtually every community uh, on the planet. And so the claims envisioned, and then I'll wrap up, in this atmospheric recovery litigation are anything ranging from common law nuisance to trespass, product liability, um, negligence, and you'll hear about these claims that have been used in these other areas of litigation from our co-panelists. Um, but these are, in essence, again, natural resource damage actions. Um, they may or may not have standalone public trust or natural resource damage claims, but even if they don't, again, I think they are very instructive. Um, we can learn lessons from these other areas, many of which have met with success. So I will conclude now um, and just say that this is a, an ambitious global project. Right now, the planet is confronting another uh, very daunting global threat. But climate crisis has not gone away amid the um, 
COVID crisis. In fact, it is waiting for solutions. And I thank the panelists for, for convening, even amidst this other crisis, to think about how we might move forward and begin to <clears throat> solve the climate crisis and maybe just also um, help solve the other crises on the horizon. What we would be doing by funding atmospheric recovery <clears throat> across the globe is we would be launching a new era of humankind. Um, we would be launching, in effect, a restoration era because this won't work uh, if done just in one region or two regions or three or four. Yes, there are hot spots that need to participate, the Amazon, the Pacific Northwest, et cetera, but this needs to be global. <clears throat> and by funding this and starting this, we literally reimagine humanity's existence across the planet. The scale of our ambition must meet the scale of our threat. So with that, um, I look forward to hearing from our uh, incredible, incredibly accomplished attorneys because they are really the, the brilliant um, strategists, the litigators who take ideas and create actual tangible lawsuits and create the law. Thank you. You're muted. Sorry, Justin, you are up. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, thank you, Callie. Thank you, Professor Wood. This is an extraordinary panel. I want to just briefly start because I think there's probably a few law students on the call and relay from my perspective as a graduate of law school, the basic context in which the practice we're discussing today exists. In law school, in the environmental clinic and in some of our coursework, we look at, for the most part, a type of practice, which is your basically your standard nonprofit environmental law practice. And that involves scrutinizing government decision making and sometimes challenging government decisions to make sure that they protect endangered species, do the proper environmental review, and otherwise comply with all the laws and regulations. What all of us do, for the most part, is somewhat different. And they, these are basically direct actions against uh, corporations, business enterprises of various types who are creating pollution. And with that context, let me talk about MTBE cases, which is my particular portion of this. The MTBE cases, by way of background, resulted initially from the federal government requiring petroleum producers, gasoline manufacturers, to add what are called oxygenates to gasoline in various areas of the country where Clean Air Act standards were not being attained. This is typically California and the Northeastern states, for example. And they had a variety of oxygenates they could have added to gasoline to reduce air pollution, but they urged the federal government and state governments to allow them to use Methyl, methyl tertiary butyl ether, or MTBE, uh, even though they knew that because all of their gas stations leaked from the delivery to the storage to the piping to the dispensing equipment, it has long been known in the industry to leak that they knew MTBE as part of gasoline would leak out of their gasoline stations and their distribution system and because of its chemical properties, it would contaminate groundwater and that it's highly toxic and that it's expensive to clean up. And that's the basic paradigm of how we got to MTBE litigation and the MTBE cases that are being litigated and have been litigated. MTBE claims are obviously where you have MTBE contaminating groundwater. And the claims are pretty typical um, across these cases. Strict product liability, and there are two different facets to strict product liability. One is design defect. So in other words, the allegation is that uh, gasoline with MTBE in it is a defective product because it's not safe when used as intended. The second category of strict products liability is failure to warn. In this case, the oil industry knew the problem that would result and they didn't warn anybody. Public nuisance is next. Sometimes it's also private nuisance. So nuisance can be either public or private. 
but it's often public when you're representing sovereigns. This is simply the sovereigns, the interference with the sovereigns use and enjoyment of their groundwater. And that's typically used for industrial purposes and for drinking water supply for their constituents. The next standard claim is negligence. The argument basically is that the defendants knew or should have known that contamination would result from their activities. The next claim is trespass. This is simply the invasion of the rights and interests in groundwater of the plaintiff sovereign in this case. Beyond that, there are often statutory and common law claims that are in addition to these sort of five standard ones or four standard ones, and they're typically particular to the jurisdiction who is bringing the suit. But strict products liability, public nuisance, negligence, and trespass are your standard claims in NTBE cases. Um, and they are also some of the claims that we're seeing in some of the climate litigation and, and as discussed by Professor Wood, proposed for the atmospheric recovery litigation. Um, I think it's clear that climate litigation has been met with a reluctant judiciary. Uh, and what atmospheric recovery litigation as discussed in the chapter that we've had a chance to review um, is focused litigation. That may be a good way to get past that judicial reluctance to provide plaintiffs with a remedy for what we all know is very clear damage. I wanna just focus on three points from the atmospheric recovery litigation concept that I think are particularly noteworthy in terms of perhaps lessons that can be transferred from the MTBE cases. Um, the first is the, the basic uh, causes of action and the, the approach in terms of talking about what the scope of the injury is, what the scope of the damages are. The second category I wanna briefly discuss is causation. And the last uh, category I briefly wanna to touch on would be um, a brief note about arguments that we see all the time, which are basically what, what we term the regulatory shield argument, basically. Um, so let me start out by talking about the, the causes of action that, that could be viable here. Um, in looking through some of the climate litigation, the second generation climate litigation has had claims for uh, products liability, negligence, nuisance. These are all types of claims that Professor Wood indicated uh, are under consideration for atmospheric recovery litigation. Um, and I would point out briefly that I think certainly the sovereign as the public trustee can bring these cases. Um, I think there's also an argument that any injured member of the public could also bring these claims because if you can prove damages as a result of the high levels of greenhouse gases in the environment, uh, whether or not you're the sovereign, you potentially have damages. So it's not terribly different conceptually than someone injured by a defective product or someone injured by the negligence of another. Um, so courts have just declined to consider the merits of the, the climate litigation uh, in part on grounds of, as described in the article, displacement and political question. Uh, in other words, they think these are issues that are outside the judiciary and they need to be taken up with the legislator, which with Congress or state legislatures or, or local governments, presumably. Um, the effort here in the write-up on atmospheric recovery litigation to tether the, the claims, the damage claims, to regional cleanups has a chance, in my mind, to basically advance a sufficiently concrete and discrete damage or injury uh, to get to the merits of these cases. In other words, to give the courts who would consider these uh, a piece of the problem that they can bite and they can chew on and they can fashion a remedy for. Um, so I think that's uh, an important aspect of the discussion here. Um, in MTBE cases, the problem and its scope are thoroughly litigated and known to all the parties in the courts. I mean, this is years of, of uh, consultants and experts testifying as to uh, what the nature and extent of the contamination is. So by the time you get to court, uh, you have typically a very clear understanding, although it may be disputed, of uh, what the nature and extent of contamination is, and typically an idea of what it's gonna take to clean that up and what that is gonna cost. Um, you don't necessarily have to know what it's gonna cost because you can seek declaratory relief, which says, 
the parties who caused the problem are liable for all the costs of cleanup. And so there is another facet to this, another potential claim uh, that, that can come into play. But I do believe that um, getting past the judicial reluctance is likely to be aided by uh, defining a, a problem that can be remedied by the courts. Um, and in part, the scope of air pollution and uh, greenhouse gas contamination, for lack of a better description, uh, is so broad and global, as Professor Wood pointed out, um, that there's something else that might be worth considering, and that is that um, in, in our cases, for example, we have, we'll take a state or a commonwealth. It has so much MTBE contamination, so many wells that are contaminated, so many aquifers that are contaminated, that it's beyond the practical ability of the court to litigate things like causation and damages for every single one of those at the same time. So what's often done is you take a bellwether approach, which is the parties agree on a subset of the aquifers or a subset of the uh, contaminated wells to litigate. Who's responsible for those? What's it gonna take to clean it up? And there's an opportunity here to consider a similar approach, which would, again, reduce this problem to something that the courts can manage and are willing to manage. Let me briefly move into, um, and I will point out that I think uh, the regional cleanups have been significantly advanced by the work by Griscom, uh, the Natural Climate Solutions in footnote three. I, I think it's incredibly important to have um, concrete actions that could be taken in order to reduce greenhouse gas uh, pollution in the atmosphere, because that gives you the opportunity to present to the court something concrete that can be done to address the injury. Let me briefly talk about uh, causation. Um, defendants will always try to push responsibility off onto others, and they will always try to persuade the court to adopt uh, what I will term, frankly, a, an unlawfully high causation standard. Um, I, I loosely refer to this as the molecule paradigm. So in our cases, for example, um, we will have defendants with respect to uh, the causation standard tell the court, unless the plaintiff can show me my molecule and how it got there and that that molecule is causing the injury, they can't recover against my client. Um, that's just simply untrue and hasn't worked. Um, CERCLA was adopted by the federal government and states now have their own versions of uh, state Superfund statutes. And it was specifically adopted because the country was confronting a lot of pollution and the real difficulty of fingerprinting the contamination back to a source. And so what Congress did was basically say, you don't have to connect every dot and prove that this defendant's molecule is the one causing your injury. You simply have to show that this person is in a category of people who would have contributed to the problem and that there is in fact a problem and then they are liable. Um, the law in most jurisdictions will vary. I'm most familiar with it in California. And what I can tell you is that we confront this argument all the time and it's completely inconsistent with the jury instructions in our state and the rest of the law. We've had defendants argue, you need to prove it's my molecule. And the courts have consistently said, no, they don't. They just have to give the jury uh, a reasonable evidentiary basis to find that it's more likely than not that your contamination caused or contributed to the problem. And so um, that's the causation standard issue that I think is important. In terms of pushing off responsibility to others, um, I think this is uh, helped enormously by the work by uh, Mr. Heaty, uh, which basically identifies the primary contributors to the greenhouse gas pollution that we all confront. Um, and so ultimately, uh, the work that's been done so far and the judicial standards as they apply uh, will allow plaintiffs, I believe, in a well-constructed lawsuit to get through these rote defenses that you will see that somebody else caused the problem and that you can't prove that my contamination is the contamination causing you the injury. Um, 
And let me finally close by uh, simply touching on the regulatory shield argument. Um, we see this all the time. In, in groundwater, the issue is the maximum contaminant level. The federal and state governments set what are called maximum contaminant levels, above which for certain chemicals, the water pro provider cannot provide that water to the public. And so they have clear damage at that point because they either have to provide alternative water supplies or procure alternative water supplies or clean up the contamination. And that's often what triggers um, our cases. But not every well has contamination exceeding the MCL. A responsible sovereign, a responsible water provider is gonna address the problem before it gets to that stage. You, you don't wait until your water supply is cut off to go out and figure out how to solve it and who's gonna pay for it and how you're gonna get it fixed. Um, and so the defendants will often try to argue that, oh, well, we were permitted to do this and this is below the acceptable levels and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Arguments we've seen before, right? My product was certified by the government. Um, I'm below the regulatory standard, whatever the case may be. Um, and courts have consistently found that uh, maximum contaminant levels or limits or permits are not a license to pollute and they don't eliminate the right of people to seek redress under the common law for, for example, a nuisance interference with their enjoyment of their property, whether it be the air, the groundwater, the climate, um, or in the case of trespass with uh, preventing people from invading their rights and interests. So um, I think with respect to the, the claims and the focusing of them on regional, regional cleanups, I think that is an important piece. Um, the causation standard I think is, is uh, Easily to easy to predict what you'll see from defendants in, in some respects. And I think that these cases as conceptualized um, are positioned to overcome those defenses. And finally, the regulatory shield defense, I don't think we'll find any more success than it has in the MTBE cases. So with that, I thank you all again, and I'll turn it back to you, Kelly. Great, thank you. All right, so we're going to uh, move it right along to Kyle, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Kelly, um, and thank you, uh, Professor Wood, for, uh, for, for hosting us, as it were, inviting us. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, good. Um, uh, I'm sort of piggybacking now on, um, on Justin's uh, comments uh, regarding MTBE, because um, a lot of, uh, the the thinking behind the PCB litigation, you know, has drawn lessons from the MTBE litigation um, in many ways. Um, there's some significant differences, um, but uh, in, in in a general sense, I think that there's uh, a lot of important lessons learned in the MTBE litigation, um, which got underway before um, PCB litigation brought by by sovereigns um, really had had taken hold. Um, and so there was some some really useful uh, case law generated in in the the uh, MDL, uh, for example, in the MTBE litigation. Um, so I suppose I will have a PowerPoint. So um, in a sense, apologies for that. But uh, at the same time, um, I, I do think uh, I've I've kept it very limited. You'll see it's uh, uh, it's got some some interesting content that I'll get to in a minute. But before I do, I uh, just wanted to kind of make a few. Uh, more general remarks uh, and give a little introduction to uh, the PCB litigation. So um, uh, I will tell you what PCBs are, but from a sort of a legal perspective, um, I, I just, you know, I like to, um, I like to think of these, these cases in a couple of different ways. Um, one, we have the kind of the vulgar economic or the simplistic economic sense, which is um, we're trying to effectively use the law to compel companies to reabsorb these kind of social and environmental externalities that they're generating, reinsert these externalities back into the production process. Um, so what they've done is they've offloaded these, um, these costs, uh, as it were, um, and didn't bear them themselves. They've offloaded them onto the public. Um, and I think that kind of, it, while it's, 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 as I said, vulgar and kind of basic, um, you know, that, that is a, that is a, a principle that is, is, um, you know, when kind of framed in that way, it makes a lot of sense in the context of, for instance, global warming, climate change related litigation. 
um, because it's it's very much a similar story, um, and that's just the nature of our uh, you know um, capitalist economy, I suppose. Um, so, from another perspective, however, you know it, it goes it goes beyond that, and I like to look at this this kind of realm of the law as um, sort of a, a series of of experiments where if we are successful. Um, uh, we will we will generate systemic consequences that reverberate across you know the fabric of the common law, um, and that's sort of more of a, a highfalutin way of saying you know that that this litigation these kinds of litigation um, could have significant uh, benefits down the road, um, whether for you know the, the next contaminant, for instance, PFAS, um, or for um, uh, climate change related litigation, atmospheric recovery uh, litigation. Um, in ways that maybe are not exactly foreseen. So I think that one of the benefits of this kind of panel is that we can kind of put our heads together a little bit and um, uh, and see some of those unforeseen connections. Um, nobody was really planning on on creating the legal groundwork for, uh, for instance, atmospheric recovery litigation when we're framing out a PCB complaint or an MTBE complaint or a PFAS complaint. But I think there's a lot of uh, very, very helpful synergies uh, going on there. Um, so I just think that what we can do as practitioners uh, is to bring cases and claims that kind of gingerly push on the boundaries of accepted environmental legal principles and NRD law, or natural resource damage law, um, make arguments that tend to establish stronger doctrinal conceptual footing uh, for these, these areas. Um, uh, one, one kind of example that comes readily to mind is that we actually asserted a public trust cause of action um, in the litigation brought against Monsanto by the state of Ohio. Um, and uh, there's, there's some case law out there, um, and there's, if, if people are familiar with the public trust uh, canon, um, it's the, the Bowling Green case um, from, from the 1970s where the Ohio Supreme Court had you know, really blessed the public trust doctrine in some very broad terms, recognizing that it's an evolving, you know, legal creature. Uh, it's an ancient, you know, legal doctrine that has to change to meet, uh, meet the needs of society as society evolves. And it's, you know, in many ways, it's a very, uh, it, it's a very apropos kind of, you know, uh, articulation of, of that doctrine, which is really the foundation for all of these cases. And then, you know, more broadly, as to, to kind of pull a phrase from um, Professor Wood, you know, this, this public trust doctrine is the, the slate upon which all constitutions are written. You know, it's, it's got that kind of, you know, um, very basic quality to it, uh, inherent to the structure of our government. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a living, breathing creature um, that really just suffuses the whole of the law. Um, so... All of those, those comments aside, um, I will kind of tell you a little bit about um, PCBs and the PCB litigation. I have to figure out just for a moment how I show you my PowerPoints. Can you see it? If I play it, can you see it? Yeah, excellent. PCBs are uh, polychlorinated biphenyls. I, I probably should have told you what it stands for, but it's not really a phrase that rolls off the tongue. Um, it's an industrial uh, chemical product uh, manufactured from 1929 to 1977 uh, by Monsanto um, and its predecessor. Um, uh, so there's, this, is a, this is a product uh, that Monsanto had cornered the market on. Um, and so we don't really run into the kind of product ID causation type of issues that Justin was flagging with respect to MTBE. Uh, you know, I think in the, in the MTBE context, I think the, you know, the, the, the gas products were coming from a variety of manufacturers and just kind of sloshing around in the tanks um, so that you had a variety of different manufacturers in play. Here, you know, when, when you're looking at a manufacturer liability theory, it's really only Monsanto. Um, basically the, the key allegations are, are summarized here. Um, 
so a couple of notes, uh, causes of action that we've, uh, we've pursued um, are largely the same common law ones that we've kind of all, all discussed and pointed to. Um, occasionally there is a, uh, um, a statutory cause of action available for a given sovereign. Um, occasionally there's some unique common law claim that's also available. Um, and we'll pursue those. Um, the most recently filed uh, case against Monsanto relating to PCBs is, uh, was put on by uh, the Attorney General of the District of Columbia, who just filed yesterday. Um, so uh, you'll see there that there's, there are some causes of action that are unique to the District of Columbia. They have a Brownfields Act, for instance, um, which is uh, an environmental statute, which um, is modeled on CERCLA, but is, is broader than CERCLA. Um, so, uh, largely what the comments that Justin made with respect to MTBE uh, causes of action kind of hold here. Um, PCBs are, uh, are industrial products that um, were used for a variety of purposes. They were used in, in paints, caulks, sealants. They were, uh, you know, briefly used as a, a potential pesticide extender. Um, they found, you know, a variety of uses, as you can imagine, just let your imagination run wild. They put it in whatever they could put it in um, back in the, the 40s and 50s, for example. Um, it was also uh, an important um, uh, uh, product because it's used in electrical equipment, uh, transistors and capacitors. So very large um, and sometimes very small. Uh, uh, electrical products that uh, need a, a dielectric fluid, a fluid to um, that, that will not explode, for instance. Um, so a high tolerance for heat. So it had some, some it's, it's, it's chemical inertness and its stability, you know, really lent itself to those kinds of uses. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, those are also the same chemical properties that end up making them environmentally uh, disastrous. Um, you know, they, they're extremely persistent, both in the environment and, you know, in, in living organisms, they're biopersistent. Uh, highly toxic, um, a recognized carcinogen by most uh, regulatory agencies who classify such things. Um, the existing, you know, human and animal studies that are out there based on worker exposure and, and, and laboratory animals, you know, also confirm strongly the toxicity. So, um, those aren't really in question in many ways. PCBs are the kind of original poster boy of, um, of toxic contaminants. Um, it was a, a, major, a major focus in the 70s when, uh, when the Toxic Substances Control Act was being passed, for example, and it was one of the first chemicals to be banned um, by, uh, by the EPA under the, uh, the regulations implementing TSCA uh, in 1979. Um, so our allegations and they're bioaccumulative as well. So there's a human, there's a direct human health exposure pathway here, um, which is uh, the uh, the chemicals um, when released from a facility uh, or from a product. You know, if they're in paint and they just run off into the into the stormwater, um, uh, they end up living quote unquote in the sediment of a waterway where stormwater is discharged. Um, and uh, and the you know the benthic organisms eat them up. Uh, they they end up being eaten by the small fish. Small fish eat the or the medium fish eat the small fish. Large fish eat the medium fish, and then we eat the large fish, um, or or other um, predators uh, higher up in the food chain. Birds and whales and things like that will, will eat the uh, eat the fish. Um, and so because they they bioaccumulate and they biomagnify up the food chain as they're consumed. Uh, you get uh, more and more exposure, right? So it ends up being, you know, even from kind of trace amounts or very small amounts of, of PCB exposure in any particular uh, exposure event, it adds up over time um, and it, uh, it ends up being uh, uh, sort of a long-term chronic exposure problem. Uh, so there's a, there's a pretty significant human health component to this case. Um, uh, chemicals are also volatile in that uh, they, uh, uh, and this is actually really important for some of the things that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment on. Um, one of the reasons that we're able to, to bring these claims against a manufacturer um, is, is because if used as intended, they would inevitably emit 
PCB vapors, or um, they would they would quote unquote volatilize. Um, and so, um, you know, manufacturer liability is not something that's captured, for instance, in Circula. Um, and this is not a problem that, um, so that's not really available for Monsanto. Um, and this is not really um, a problem that comes up in the MTBE context because uh, there you have manufacturers who are also suppliers, right? So you have Exxon manufacturing MTBE gas um, and Exxon running gas stations or, you know, running a, you know, underground storage tanks or something. So, you know, you, you don't really have this, this issue. Monsanto only had its operations, you know, in, in one or two parts of the country. Um, and, you know, its PCBs are, are everywhere. They're in all the, you know, almost every state. Um, it has has a PCB issue. Um, so you have this this question of, you know, maybe they engaged in some misconduct, but are they liable for that for that injury? And and the answer, um, you know, to my mind is is an overwhelming yes. And in part, it's because um, of the the volatilization risk. Um, they knew that um, the chemicals would release PCB vapors during their ordinary use. Um, and, uh, and that goes back to them. That doesn't go back to the direct user of the product, somebody using PCB paint, for example. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's more of a, maybe there's a strict liability argument as to that user, but, um, when it comes to who's at fault, you know, if it's a question of fault, it's Monsanto who, who manufactured and, and knew about, um, these, these chemical properties. Um, so that's kind of a point of distinction with MTBE, which is actually from a, from a sort of a doctrinal perspective does, does end up being kind of important. Um, uh, yeah, they were responsible for 99% of the domestic PCB production. It's actually more than that. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, there's, you know, potentially certain companies that made very, very, very small amounts of PCBs. And then there's inadvertent PCB production, which we have to account for as well. It's very small, but there's inadvertent PCBs out there as well. Um, Monsanto made them from 1935 to 77. From 1929 to 35, it was the Swan Chemical Company, which Monsanto acquired in 1935. Um, and as I mentioned here, the PCBs are now, and because they're persistent, they will continue to be uh, contaminants in waterways, surface waters, um, sediment fish, aquatic life, wildlife, um, and stormwater nationwide. And you also find it in soils because there's a lot of dredging and then people dump the dredged soil and it becomes clean fill or landfill. Um, so I'm going to show you some documents and I don't know that you can actually see everything depending on your layout of the screen. For me, it's actually cutting off part of the document um, because of the, uh, the little pictures. But um, what I've kind of compiled here are a couple of documents um, which are publicly accessible and which are uh, typically attached to our um, to to some of the complaints that we filed, not all, um, but this is a document where the choice quote um, from a, 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 a medical executive um, is uh, 1955. We know Aerochlores are toxic. Aerochlor is the trade name for the PCB products. So um, I'm just going to kind of run through these a little bit. This is an important uh, point because this is a this is a document from the late 1960s where um, the company was looking at how to handle this crisis that it was sort of you know, rapidly being ensnared in, um, and this is a, a frank assessment of um, of some of the some of the points of knowledge um, that they had come to come to. Um, reflected here. So he's saying through abrasion and leaching, we can assume that nearly all of this aerochlor winds up in the environment. So um, this is them kind of frankly acknowledging the volatilization point earlier. Um, they're putting products out into the stream of commerce and, uh, you know, fully acknowledging that um, over time as, as, you know, just due to weather events, um, you're going to see PCBs uh, getting into natural resources and, you know, there's nothing we can do to stop it. It's it's out there. Um, there was a uh, what they called an Aerochlor ad hoc committee uh, compiled or convened in the late 1960s as well, um, and this was their um, this was their plan of action, right? Which was uh, come up with ways to one permit continued sales and profits of Aerochlors. 
Um, two, permit continued development of uses and sales. In other words, open new markets, open new markets for these products. Um, well, three, protecting the image of the organic division and of the corporation. So it's like, you know, there's a little cognitive dissonance there, um, you know, with sort of, you know, continue making money, keep getting these products out there. In fact, expand the market for them, yet look like we're the good guys. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's an interesting document. Um, this is another interesting one from 1970 where, uh, uh, Another medical executive at Monsanto is acknowledging PCBs are about the same as DDT in mammals. Um, that's an, that's a, an interesting way to phrase it because Monsanto was also, as you may know, a manufacturer of DDT. Um, and so, you know, nobody really had better, uh, a better understanding of the toxicity and ecotoxicity of, of you know, pesticide products like DDT um, than Monsanto. Um, so, um, you know, on one side of the corporation, they're manufacturing PCBs, and the other side, they're manufacturing DDT. They end up doing all these studies and finding out that chlorinated hydrocarbons as a class have all these you know, negative, negative human health and animal health and environmental effects. Um, uh, and, and yeah, and so end up, you know, DDT ends up being curtailed, but you know, PCBs still go on because you know, nobody was really paying attention to PCBs. There was no silent spring for PCBs. Um, and so, uh, that it's just an interesting document um so uh yet another reflection of of the analysis that they did internally uh while they were trying to figure out the way out of this situation in the 60s um they were you know frankly acknowledging that they there's selfishly too much monsanto profit to go out of the pcb market um and so they didn't um and this is a document that was provided to their sales team um we can't afford to lose one dollar of business. It's just a reminder that um, don't take any guff from uh, customers who are upset that we sold them toxins for decades um, and didn't tell them that they were toxic, didn't tell them how to dispose of them safely. Um, you know, this is just a boost of confidence for the salespeople. You know, um, not to not to take any product back. You know, we're not giving anything up. We're, we'll work with you because now we have to work with you, but, um, you know, we can't afford to lose $1 business. Um, so those are just a couple of, of really interesting documents. Um, and I don't know if, I'm, if, I'm, if you can see my screen or not, Callie, maybe you can. How do I do that? Well, I'll worry about it in a second. Um, so one of the kind of upshots from this, um, is that we're looking at a manufacturer liability case, right? Um, it's, it's very similar in some ways to the carbon majors who um, are providing uh, products which have these um, devastating environmental and human health effects. Um, and so um, in many cases, and you can, you can analogize this in a number of different ways, but in many cases, um, the companies themselves, the carbon majors, are not necessarily releasing um, uh, all of the carbon dioxide, for instance. You know, they're releasing staggering amounts through their, through their extractive um, uh, practices. But um, in terms of, you know, manufacturing, refining gasoline and putting it out there, and then, you know, millions and millions of people are driving their cars, for instance. Um, you know who's who's the re, who's the one that's releasing those those chemicals, right? Um, so in some respects, with respect to some usage of the products, the PCB litigation has more analogies uh, to to climate related litigation than MTBE does. Um, you know, because here we have the manufacturer distributing PCB products but didn't actually come into the jurisdiction in question necessarily and, and release them. Um, just knew that they were going to get released, failed to, you know, failed to take certain steps, failed to take certain precautions, failed in its duties to the public, um, but you know, is not, not necessarily the quote unquote point source. Um, so the, the question, the, the issue is the manufacturer's knowledge and the ability to foresee um, that its toxic products would inevitably leave their ordinary applications or just by virtue of their ordinary and intended usage 
uh, would result in these injuries is really pivotal to establishing liability. And it's the same kind of story that you see with, um, with, with the, the carbon majors, um, because it's, it's their, um, it's their understanding that if you use the products that they're putting out there, um, inevitably, you know, this will be the effect. And of course they've gone through and modeled it and they understand it. And there's no question of foreseeability. Um, much the same way with Monsanto, you know, it's not even just, it's not even foreseeability. It's, it's that the injury was foreseen in fact. And I showed you a document where, you know, they're acknowledging, frankly, that these, these chemicals are going to get into the environment inevitably. Um, and that's really, that's the, that's the causation, you know, narrative, the fate and transport narrative that is so central to, um, the causation argument in the PCB litigation. I think something similar is probably necessary um, in the context of atmospheric recovery litigation. Um, I suppose, you know, that's, that's about all I wanted to say, subject to any kind of questions or input from anyone else. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do want to just kind of reiterate that I think that the, the public trust uh, doctrine and the, the sort of the, the opportunities that exist for sovereign plaintiffs in particular to pursue, um, you know, innovative legal theories, um, you know, is, is a true opportunity, is a, is a you know, um, a, a critical opportunity to develop the law in a very favorable way um, in the context of, of environmental protection, you know, certainly much more so than anything you're going to see out of uh, today's EPA. Nice. Um, Kyle, I think if you want to exit your screen sharing, there you yeah. go. Um, feel free to jump in panelists, but otherwise um, I was going to see if Alan wanted me to play your PowerPoint or do you want to sh screen share yourself and play your own PowerPoint? How about you do it? Uh, okay. <laughs> I will do you. that. I, and you can just tell me when to, um, change the slide. Okay, so one second. All right. It's coming. Sorry. Oh. Hey, Dan. <laughs> Dan, yes. Yes. Would you actually play Alan's? I have a security. I can, thing. I can put it up. I just don't know if I can take it down. Um, let me do that, all right? <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, it's um, not letting me share. I think I can. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Man, like I've been doing it all my life. You're uh, <laughs> all right. Um, First, thank you for, for having me and um, putting me uh, on such a great panel. I mean, uh, all, of these, all of these people are really superstars in their field. And I think it's good to sort of share ideas and uh, because we're all committed, I think, to moving the law further. My particular, uh, and, and I wanna be clear, I'm not sure what the right path is to climate justice in the long run. Um, but for me, I've been focusing a lot on state public trust law um, in the last couple of years. In the, you know, sometime in the late 80s, it dawned on me that, that nothing was being restored in the environment. I mean, every dump site in America was still in site remediation for the 20th or 30th year uh, since Superfund was passed. And the promise of Superfund had originally been both a cleanup and a restoration of resources. Um, and so for me, uh, I realized Superfund was a pretty bad law because it requires that you do finish site remediation before you start natural resource damages which means you're never gonna start natural resource damages. So I started looking at state laws, state common law, the public trust doctrine. And I began to see it as, as some of our other panelists have as a vehicle for both ecological restoration and ultimately environmental justice. Uh, I think the recent case law 
uh, has begun to read the public trust more broadly than it has been read historically, though the public trust has always been seen as an evolving doctrine. Um, you see this in NRD cases, in PCBs, MTBE, and PFAS litigation. Um, in addition to Ohio versus Monsanto, which followed the Bowling Green case, in New Jersey recently, state of New Jersey versus Exxon at Lale, we also put a, a, a standalone claim for public trust, the tort of public trust, um, and we survived the motion to dismiss. So. Um, we may be gaining some traction. Uh, I think I, I understand it's one of the things the defense bar fears the most is that courts will be able to do public trust um, litigation. So brief history, um, because th there's some confusing jargon in all of this, all right? But um, so it go the public trust started with Justinian. Um, he was a Roman emperor, he had slaves, uh, but he had people who wrote stuff down and he said you got to protect certain natural resources that belong to everybody. Uh, for example, the beaches. Why? Because fishermen needed to lay their nets out there. Um, it was kind of a commercial orientation, which by the way is most cases took a commercial orientation into the beginning of this century. Primarily because that's how the public interest was, was defined. Um, very important point. States acquired the public trust as a result of winning independence. Uh, there's a Supreme Court case, Martin versus Waddell's lessee. The great thing about that is it pointed out that the states acquired the sovereign, King George's uh, public trust, even before there was a constitution. Remember in the constitution, you've got the 10th amendment that says the states reserve all the rights that they haven't given up all, uh, already. Um, the, and just so we know, there, there aren't a lot of cases in the Supreme Court that talk about the public trust for the federal government in quite the same, with quite the same vigor as um, you get it in, in cases like Martin, you know, on behalf of the states. For example, the original cases in the federal courts came out of um, the fact that the US government held vast pieces of land for sale, distribution, and whatever. And so they, were, they, they obviously had a responsibility because they were gonna keep it forever. And so they started using some of the fiduciary language that you see in public trust cases. My, my belief is that the state public trust is, sits on a more secure footing um, than the federal trusts do. Um, so, um, tons of cases, U.S. Supreme Court, state Supreme Courts, uh, you know, I've listed three here, but really there's so many more. Uh, I guess Illinois Central was very important. Public trust was recognized as dynamic and evolving concept. There, the state of Illinois actually gave um, uh, land and uh, along the beach to the railroad company and that had to be undone um, and so always remember when you think about the public trust there's this it's both dynamic it's it's dynamic and evolving but around what the fiduciary should be doing um, one of the things that I like about this area of the law is the Supreme Court has consistently recognized that federal environmental laws do not disp displace state law. They take the notion of dual sovereignty very seriously. Congress has. If you look at virtually all environmental statutes, there is an express savings clause for, for state law rights. And we've argued that that would include the state public trust right. Um, uh, last week, I think, or beginning of this week, I mean, time has kind of been a blur since, I'm, <laughs> since it all started, but uh, uh, the Supreme Court in Atlantic Richfield took a case from the Mo uh, Montana Supreme Court, very great decision. They cut it back some, but basically said, you get to keep all of your common law rights. You just can't exercise them in a way that interferes with an ongoing uh, cleanup. Um, I don't think that really changes doctrine at all. Um, I would count it as, as 
basically being positive towards a state law. Um, so the public trust, you know, not to get too much into, uh, you know, the justice component of it, but I mean, in a way, the public trust says we are all equal in our claim to certain natural resources. Um, that's phenomenal because we've all grown up with things like, um, you know, oil companies or coal companies getting these federal leases for, you know, pennies on the dollar to do whatever they want. Um, even mineral rights. I mean, that's not a concept they have in Europe, but in the United States, we have that concept. Uh, I see it eroding and I, I see courts looking at some of these transfers and I'll talk about that later, but public trust is fundamentally rooted in equality. Professor Sachs, um, he was at Berkeley and University of Michigan in the 70s. He's credited with sort of resurrecting the old public trust doctrine and bringing it into modern environmental times. Uh, he said a couple of things that were flawed um, and that, you know, you get a lot of people who cite Professor Sachs, but they really won't reveal what their methodology is. He, he never really talked about the constitutive elements of a cause of action for public trust. He said there is a public trust, there is a duty for fiduciaries to do certain things, uh, and it ought to get done, but never really spelled out exactly what uh, people like Justin and, and Kyle and I worry about on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, what's the judge looking for? You know, what's the Court of Appeals looking for, uh, you proving your case? He famously said, though, that the great thing about the public trust is it makes us more than mere serfs. We're co-owners of the earth. We're all in this together. And it was emphatically recognized that the key to the doctrine is the fiduciary duty for the state trustees. Given that duty and the evolving public interest, trustees have to have legal tools to discharge its fiduciary duties. I think that's how you grow um, uh, st state public trust, the state public trust law. Um, and I, I can see how it might well extend to the atmospheric trust uh, uh, notion. Uh, the only limitation, the main limitation is that states, you know, let's say take New Jersey, industrial state, lots of pollution there, lots of greenhouse gases, but query whether you could, if you actually got all the compensation, yes, you could restore wetlands. Yes, you could, uh, which are which are great. They, yes, you could restore the pine barrens in certain areas. Um, but there'd come a point where you probably couldn't spend all the money in New Jersey. Um, and so the question then becomes, can you have interstate compacts where different states cooperate in different projects uh, that are mutually beneficial? Um, so that's, I still, there, there, I have not thought through exactly how to connect it up, but it seems really very consistent with the atmospheric trust. Uh, and I understand why some cases have used a federal approach, uh, an international approach. Um, but I try to look at what, what do I think judges will do, you know, and under the rule of, you know, continuity in order to get change. Um, I find this to be a, a very dynamic area of the law that it's moving positively. Um, and by the way, I, I, I love some of the remedies that uh, the professor has laid out. Um, you know, we have often thought in terms of restoring sites to pre-pollution conditions. Um, and in Deepwater Horizon, I re represented the state of Louisiana for the oil spill. And one of the th and so, you know, they destroy 100 acres of wetland. What do we want to do? We want to put in maybe 200 acres of wetland, replace the 100, and then there's loss of use before that wetland really becomes fully productive. So there's, there's that loss of use damage in addition to restoration that you see in these NRD cases. But then we have to confront the fact that, well, climate change is happening. And, you know, some of these marshes are going to be underwater in a few years. And uh, I, you know, had I been thinking about this more, um, and, and, and this is still evolving. I mean, we have this 
hunk of money in Louisiana and they're, it's in a lockbox. A uh, legislature can't get at it. Um, and it's, it can only get spent so much at a time. And I suspect that in a few years, they will be thinking about integrating climate change into the natural resource damage uh, area. Just some uh, terms uh, that I think are very important. Um, okay, so public trust is different from parents' patriot. There, there, in my view, there are three ways the state can sue. You can sue in your proprietary capacity. Okay, we're not talking about that. Okay, that's the state owns a piece of land, somebody dumps some pollution on it, they have the same rights as a landowner to get their money. Okay, proprietary capacity. Um, we see many, many decisions under parents' patriot. That's the notion that the state on behalf of the people can bring a lawsuit, you know, to, to stop a public nuisance. Uh, in the old days, uh, somebody would, you know, uh, their boat would crash in a stream that was uh, used for navigation. You know, they could sue to have the guy remove the wreckage and, you know, get commerce going. Um, public trust is different in the sense that it's a standalone claim. It has to be rooted in the state's fiduciary duties um, and it would be a tort, tortious interference with the public trust. Um, parents' patriae is a little bit more of a standing concept. It allows the state to use traditional torts, generally public nuisance, to sue for its quasi-sovereign interest. The interesting thing is when you go through the case law, and there's a lot of cases that talk about public trust, they basically say, this is a public trust, as, as did Professor Sachs, this public trust case, um, state wins. But you know, you're like, well, what do they plead? Uh, you know, it might be interesting to go back and look for the pleadings, but because he doesn't really talk about negligence, doesn't talk about nuisance, doesn't talk about um, uh, you know, other uh, trespass as the theory. It's just, oh, it's the public trust, uh, which gave me some hope that maybe it has a gravitational pull unique from what we see in parents' patriae cases. Um, let me know if I'm getting too technical for you, okay? Um, but uh, so the public trust has evolved um, and it's being driven by the harms of synthetic living and the emergence of robust strict liability that's, you know, both Kyle and Justin, if, uh, already spoken to. For example, most traditional nuisance cases really involve some bad actor blocking access to a waterway or, or road. Uh, it took a long time before pollution of natural resources was recognized as nuisance. Though um, in an early article, I did go back to the 1300s uh, and find a few cases out of England where they talked about the stink and nuisance of, of some factories and whatnot. Um, so it always had that potential, just wasn't harnessed. Uh, the products cases force us to think about foreseeable damages to natural resources as opposed to damages to users of the resource. Um, so much of early toxic tort litigation was all about harm to people um, or their property. Now we're, we're looking more at natural resources um, like Kyle, I mean, in um, we're now starting with in some state lawsuits to talk about uh, uh, the restoration uh, available under public trust. Though we plead in the alternative, and we also plead in parents' patriae under different theories. Um, so, what would a public trust um, look like? Uh, what would a cause of action for public trust look like? Um, you'd have to show one, that there's a protected public interest or resource. Um, I think that, that we're all, we already are used to doing that and the public interest resource may evolve over time. Uh, I think that in the 80s, it turned into things like environmental, ecological restoration goals. Whereas maybe in the 20s, it was all about, you know, commerce, 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 that will take the hindmost. Second, an unreasonable interference. And third, a nexus between that interference and damage to the public interest or resource can be demonstrated. Um, I'm working on something right now that
that uh, deals with these elements specifically and tries to you know, flesh out uh, the aspects of each. I talked about it a little bit earlier in a Duke article, um, but one other component that I think is very important, especially, uh, is the deference we owe trustees uh, on what are the appropriate remedies. Um, I don't talk about remedies in terms of something like an atmospheric trust, but what, what are trustees supposed to do in order to execute their fiduciary duties? Well, first, they have to investigate the harm. Second, they have to determine a, a, a suite of, of remedies to affect the restoration and to make the public whole. Um, the, and in a way, what, what I've seen in cases that I've tried, like the Exxon trial, 66 days that just seemed like an eternity, um, uh, that what we, learned is defendants try to argue that the state is subject to these Daubert type junk science rules. And the thrust of our position was, no, 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 we, we do have experts and you can cross examine them on their methodology, but we the trustees are entitled to draw our own inferences because what we do is both science and public policy and adherence to law. And so I think one, one key component I haven't seen a lot on, that's why I wrote the thing, was, you know, what, is, what, is the, what are the powers and what is the respect that a trustee is entitled to? Public trust issues, I think, going forward. The old case law verbiage is sloppy. Sometimes you have a judge writing an opinion saying, you know, this is a violation of the public trust, and then he does a nuisance analysis. Um, or, uh, you know, he says it's a parent patriae case because this is a unique resource that has to be protected, period, without really talking about what law was used. And, but, but what it does say is people care about the public trust, and it's, it hasn't really been articulated uh, as, as a standalone concept. It's m going in that direction. We're much further ahead than we were 10 years ago, and it's going to keep going forward, um, and it's going to be developed case by case in the courts. Um, so discussion of common law, uh, uh, the way I see it, some of the public trust cases that I, I consider public trust cases, uh, you do see a lot of discussions of common law torts, and it occurred to me that what they're really saying is, this goes to the unreasonableness of the interference with public trust. Um, you know, how can it be reasonable if it would otherwise be a nuisance? Um, how could it be reasonable if it's an invasion? One of the virtues of having the standalone um, public trust doctrine is that when you bring a parent's patriae suit, say public nuisance, there's a balancing that goes on there. You know, the private interest, public interest. Uh, under public trust, the public interest trumps, in all cases, um, other interests. Trespass, you know, there have been a number of trespass cases that have gone both ways in the parents' patriae co context. Trespass is a great law because just the mere invasion of the resource is enough. You don't even have to document uh, any kind of substantial harm. But courts say, oh, you you can't sue for that because you don't own it. You don't have that proprietary interest. Uh, and then, you know, lawyer says, well, you know, it's the public interest. And the judge says, see, it's somebody else's interest. You can't sue. So, but then how does that interest ever get protected? Who can, who can protect it? Um, that's yet another reason for a standalone public trust doctrine. Um, the whole point of a trust is basically to authorize a trustee to protect the corpus in, uh, of the benefit for the public. Um, trustee has to determine uh, public interest, has to assess damage, they have to determine what remedy falls within their broad discretion. And changing conceptions of public interest relative to private property um, is now taking place. And it's not necessarily taking. There's a number of really exciting cases out of New Jersey, um, like East Cape May, where somebody had a grant to build uh, you know, to fill in all this wetland at the turn of the century. And for whatever reason, they didn't, and the property passed down in title. And comes the 70s, the 
person says, well, I want to fill it in. Um, and the courts say, no, you can't. And they say, well, this is my property right. They say, no, it's not. You, you, you always took subject to the public trust, uh, the jus publicum, as uh, they said in the old Roman world, versus jus privatum. Uh, and so because it's subject to, you never had that right to, to destroy public trust. And the fact that they changed their mind about what's in the public interest um, doesn't really matter. And, and I think that, and so New Jersey has often said, the Supreme Court, that in some of the beach access cases that it's famous for, that no compensation is, is due to the person who has to give way to the public trust. Um, uh, again, uh, a lot more work needs to be done on remedies. Um, what would work, especially in, in these trying times with uh, dealing with climate change, what would be most effective? Um, but I, I, you know, as the law evolves, so will our discussions. And then our discussions will, will make us dream of even more evolution in the law. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say right now. If anybody has questions down the road, that's fine too. Um, now let's see how my stop share skills are. Yes. Hey. <laughs> Very good. All right. Wow, this has been wonderful so far. We have one more panelist. And again, we'll have questions at the end. So you can send them to me via chat or jump in at the end whenever, but we've got Dan Galpern. Okay. <laughs> Not that I want to send any subliminal uh, messages. But I have a, uh, I have a PowerPoint to share too. And I'm going to <clears throat> try to keep my remarks uh, pretty brief because we have had a lot of discussion so far already. It's already an hour and a half in. Um, so, <clears throat> question is, how do I get there? Is that now shared? Yep. And you can hit presenter view and present if you want it to be bigger, but we can see it from this way too. Presenter view? Yeah, if you just sort of like go into the PowerPoint and hit actually slideshow present i think yeah play from start yeah um so i want to take a a step back a little bit and give a, a little more detail uh particularly about uh remedies and so uh i think this slideshow really is a footnote to what Professor Mary Wood and, uh, and Alan Kenner just said. But here is a nice depiction of the uh, enveloping uh, problem, um, showing a balance of sources and sinks. And at the top is, um, in the gray, is uh, fossil fuel emissions. So emissions below zero are uh, the sinks and emissions uh, that are actually uh, occurring from various sources are those above zero. And predominantly, although uh, initially until uh, approximately uh, uh, 1955 or so, uh, land use changes were adding as much uh, uh, CO2 to the, to the atmosphere as uh, fossil fuel consumption. But uh, in recent decades, it's, uh, the problem is over, overwhelmingly uh, our em emissions of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, the ocean uh, uh, is a sink, and uh, with the increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration, uh, it has become a more important sink, although uh, as we continue, there's concern that uh, with, with saturation and that the ocean may actually become a uh, source. The land surface is an important and uh, growing uh, sink, uh, but there are uh, always, uh, there, there's a growing concern uh, about saturation there. And then the balance of the emissions are now residing in the atmosphere. And um, I wrote about this, uh, I guess now uh, nearly 20 years ago, but the um, 
the the problem over 20 years ago now the problem derives in in part from the fact that uh, a significant share of any burst of um, co2 emission of co2 into the atmosphere essentially stays there forever and that share of uh, emissions uh, unless drawn down uh, into uh, the uh, our geologic systems or our land systems and that share uh, regrettably um, is growing and so um, when MIMS discussed the nature of the problem uh, it is correct that we are so far in uh, we have so far overshot the safe level of atmospheric co2 which is roughly about 350 parts per million or less um, that in order to um, avoid uh, the worst tipping points, namely de de destabilization of um, the uh, major ice sheets, um, we need to rapidly phase out virtually all fossil fuel emissions and in addition to draw down a substantial amount of the excess atmospheric CO2. I said that the, the safe uh, level is roughly about 350 parts per million and we're already uh, uh, close to 410 parts per million uh, atmospheric CO2. So uh, one set of options to draw down um, excess atmospheric CO2 is really falls in the category of highly technological carbon removal. So that includes a direct air capture, uh, manipulation of ocean chemistry, uh, accelerating we uh, accelerated weathering and enhanced uh, mineral uptake, um, and the coupling of energy production from uh, renewable biological feedstocks uh, with carbon capture and storage, so-called uh, BECs. And there's been um, some significant uh, research and development here, a lot more is needed. The problem is that those technologies, sometimes called negative emission technologies, are to date exceptionally uh, expensive. Um, <clears throat> but there are more efficient, that is economical methods of uh, removing excess atmospheric CO2. Um, more cost effective really by uh, an order of magnitude or more. Um, and this was mentioned by um, Professor Wood and I think also uh, Kyle, the so-called natural climate solutions. Um, <clears throat> and th so they include um, conservation and restoration and improved land management actions, which have the virtue of increasing carbon storage um, and or avoiding greenhouse gas emissions uh, across uh, forests, wetlands, grasslands, and agricultural lands. <clears throat> and the um, paper uh, published in 2017 in the journal Nature by Krisham and others, and if anyone needs the uh, citation, I can get it to them, uh, analyzed the potential uh, in these various categories, nation by nation. So a tremendous contribution to our understanding of what, what the capacity is if we were to manage our natural systems to draw down excess, atm uh, 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 excess atmospheric CO2. They, they failed to aggregate uh, those numbers, um, so I did it here. Uh, and as you can see, uh, by far the um, largest chunk of this is reforestation or improved management of natural forests. But uh, 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 there are uh, significant, although much smaller, but significant uh, benefits that can be in, achieved through improved grazing practices, 
um, the uh, reclamation of uh, mangrove forests and the restoration of uh, peatlands and so on. Now, <clears throat> there are, I think, essentially three ways or three major actors uh, who can do anything significant in this area. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and, and this, this shows how important the natural carbon um, solutions types of mitigations and drawdown uh, can be. And now this is with respect to a two degree pathway, that is what kind of, what kind of changes are needed uh, in our economy to the you know, ability to continue to utilize the atmosphere as an open sewer for its uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, fossil fuel mitigation in itself is not sufficient really to get down to zero by the year 2050. Uh, and so it is uh, this then if you were to add in significant mitigation could actually uh, enable us to move, at least under this scenario, scenario from a pathway to catastrophe to um, survival. So this is how it comes in. And you'll notice that looking just at what, is, what was, was deemed necessary at that time to be done by the year 2030, uh, natural carbon solutions mitigation actions if undertaken now, um, would achieve uh, virtually half of uh, the mitigation that is needed uh, by, by 2030. All right, so that's, that's the importance of this area. All right, so there, as I was starting to say, there are, I think, three um, basic uh, actors that we can uh, conceive of who can, you know, undertake the type of uh financing of these carbon drawdown projects uh even if even if they were reserved only to natural carbon solution uh, projects but certainly also if we were also also talking about the much much more expensive direct air capture and becks and that sort of thing they are first nations that is nations um i think likely coordinated via the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, so as to ensure that uh, those nations with the highest capacity uh, would receive uh, the funding. But of course, if nations are doing it, then, then the work is being paid for by the citizens, citizenry, uh, you know, uh, in, in contrast to um, the basic principle that the polluter should pay. Um, they are corporations, and corporations could, I think, be forced, uh, could be either be forced uh, to do this, uh, to draw down their fair share of the excess atmospheric CO2, or they could do so uh, voluntar voluntarily. And wouldn't that be nice, actually, to have uh, the corporations do it on their own accord? Um, to set a, an example of uh, good citizenship. Is that, you know, merely a pipe dream? I mean, the, the, the virtue there is that you would have, uh, uh, perhaps, you know, it's un, unrealistic to conceive of fossil fuel companies doing it on, on their own accord. Uh, certainly, you know, likely not until they are, um, uh, compelled either by uh, uh, national or subnational statutory requirements or else in response to um, the fear of lawsuits or regulation so as to get ahead of the curve. But if a uh, major corporation that has uh, resources and has, for example, um, uh, utilized a tremendous amount of fossil, fossil fuel uh, energy, um, you know, uh, were to do it well, then then that could serve as a as a good example. So, with respect to nations, um, the justification for them to act is that they have, of course, 
encouraged fossil fuel exploitation and production and shipping and consumption uh, via you know, state and federal permits, um, subsidies, funded research, and, and perhaps you know, somewhat uh, less directly by their um, reckless, recklessly negligent uh, failure to restrict emissions. Uh, so it would be appropriate for nations to assume a responsibility here, um, and uh, if not, for citizens to uh, uh, demand it. But there is the rather small problem, I guess, um, that um, the policies and, and politics in uh, the major uh, emitting nations are have been, in fact, heavily uh, influenced or corrupted by fossil fuel money, including uh, especially by uh, fossil fuel uh, producers. So again, as to voluntary actions by corporations, um, is that uh, just a pipe dream? Is it impossible to think of any corporation actually coming forward and recognizing the burden that it's, for example, consumption of uh, fossil fuels uh, over decades as, and profiting from its ability uh, to utilize uh, that cheap uh, energy? Um, is it impossible for, to conceive of, of uh, such a major corporation doing something voluntarily? Well, in fact, it's not impossible to conceive of that. Um, a few months ago, Microsoft announced that it would be carbon negative by the year 2030. Um, and in their release on this, they wrote that by 2030, they will be carbon negative and by 2050, Microsoft will have removed from the environment all the carbon the company has emitted either directly or by electrical consumption since it was founded in 1975. So this is actually, um, I think, a tremendous uh, development um, that, uh, that, that uh, should really stand as a model not only to other companies, including potentially fossil fuel companies, but as a model even to the nations, which have, none of which have even committed through their nationally intended contribution through the UN FCCC system uh, to this type of um, public responsibility. Okay, and then of course there are lawsuits to uh, compel producers to uh, pay, utilizing the polluter pay uh, principle. Now I think here I uh, I reprint a chart from the Climate Accountability Institute, uh, uh, Rick Heady's group, because I think it's important to understand that we're not only talking about private companies. Um, as potential defendants. Um, I have here uh, highlighted in yellow uh, state-owned uh, companies, fossil fuel companies, and underlined in green uh, those state-owned companies that yet have a substantial but still minority private ownership shareholders. Uh, this represents, by the way, companies whose emissions over the period 1965 to 2017 account for about 35% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So just the top 20, uh, Professor Wood noted that you could get almost all of, all of the major producers in, in a bus of, uh, that held just 90. Uh, producers, but this is just the top 20, top 20 account for 35 percent. And so, you know, about half or so are private uh, corporations, but uh, a number of them are uh, state-owned, that is nation-owned uh, oil and gas and coal companies. Well, there's also the question then about where to sue and potentially closely related, um, where 
the dollars that are sought in remedy would be spent. And there's a, it, there's a you know, it, it requires some thinking uh, because not unexpectedly there's a mismatch here between nations that may want or states that may want to undertake the lawsuits and where those dollars can best be spent. So I'm going to move on. Uh, this is not of producers, this is of uh, nations, but of course there's a lot of producers in the major emitting uh, nations. And this shows, for example, that over the uh, period uh, since the Industrial Revolution, the United States by far, well, the United States has a number of private uh, fossil fuel producers, and the United States by far in terms of the emissions that have been uh, that that have been released within its jurisdiction or where it's responsible for accounts for nearly a quarter of all historic fossil fuel emissions and so virtually 25 percent of the problem of residual atmospheric co2 that is uh, inducing dangerous climate change Well, here is the, again, this is uh, based on natural climate solutions uh, research, but it's my summary and chart of where in the world the most natural climate solutions carbon, emission, uh, carbon removal capacity resides. And so for example, here I noted that while you know 25% of all historic emissions uh, were from the United States, but here you can see the sliver of the United States. The United States' capacity uh, for uh, carbon removal through again through nat natural means is only five percent of the world uh, capacity. Uh, Brazil uh, has the largest capacity. Uh, for you know, deriving largely because of its potential for reforestation or uh, preserving existing uh, forests, particularly the Amazon uh, and China, which is which is a major uh, emitter, but Brazil is not, uh, and Indonesia, which again is not a major emitter, but is has a uh, major capacity for carbon removal. And so this illustrates then um, the need, in my view at least, that there be an international fund um, uh, that would be funded in part either through voluntary contributions or in part through damage uh, carbon uh, drawdown or atmospheric recovery, damage uh, remedies uh, where the money would then go to uh, projects where you can get the most bang for the buck. And in my view, I think that would be best administered through a fund and an entity that is linked with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, that already has the uh, world's imprimatur and authority to be trying to figure out how to uh, address the uh, enveloping uh, calamity. Uh, and that is so because, uh, for example, uh, it, it may not be that as possible, for example, to launch a suit uh, in Brazil um, may be more possible to launch a suit in the United States and have uh, the funds collected but in remedy, if this, is, if this were doctrinally possible, uh, to be utilized uh, where it makes the most sense. So let's see here. Uh, for that reason, then, for the last three um, conferences of the party to the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, 
uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Hansen and I have gone there and promoted this idea. Um, it still hasn't been fully taken up, but uh, you know we've only been trying for uh, three years. And I think you know what what this uh, what this implies is that um, we need to figure out and end quickly because we only have a few decades to get this underway in any serious uh, if, if we if we intend to actually preserve a viable uh, climate system for ourselves and our uh, future, our children and our progeny. Uh, that uh, there does need to be not only these uh, individual lawsuits, um, but some substantial international coordination uh, to ensure that it is done where it most makes sense and where we can get the most benefit for the uh, remedy dollars. So I'll stop there. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, you all have so much great information to share. We have been going for quite a while, but I figured we could just give a couple of minutes at the end for either panelists to remark to each other or anyone from the audience to feel free to um, ask any questions. Um, I can unmute you or um, you can send me a question via chat if you would like. Everyone there. <laughs> I have one. I have one question for um, Alan. Can I ask a question of Alan? Yeah, of course. <laughs> can uh, Alan? Can a? Uh, in your mind, can a claim for tortious interference with public trust resources only be launched, brought by a uh, sovereign? In America, uh, uh, yes, uh, unless uh, Environmental Rights Act type things that might let people step in. But um, I think you would probably have to sue the sovereign for not acting or for acting, you know, sort of a, like the writ of quo warranto, you know, by what, what right do you stand, you know, not stand down. But it, there's just this connect, I mean, it's really kind of gorgeous. I mean, the connection is between sovereignty and the trust and that the sovereign democratically elects, you know, a statewide leader uh, who in turn picks somebody as a state trustee. Um, so I, I've seen some cases where people have tried and courts uh, generally slap them down as, you know, it's not yours. And, and you see it also with like local government actions. Right. So what you're saying is that most for a citizens group, if they were in, uh, intent on this, they could bring a public nuisance claim uh, alleging the interference with their, their ability to utilize and enjoy resources that are supposed to be in the public trust. Yeah, but the trustee has, a, has broad discretion. I mean, that's the nature, I mean, that's the conundrum in, to your question because the trustee, the notion of the trustee is to um, uh, do as much as possible um, to maximize its view of what the public trust is. I mean, if you had a situation where nothing was happening, um, I don't know. Um, I, I just haven't seen any case law where yeah. an individual citizen can sue the state. Um, the, they can intervene before, I think, intervene in like any settlement states make, and they've done that before to comment on the remedies. Um, but no, I, but what it does do, like, so, so just take it one step further. Um, so what do you do if you have a bad sovereign or bad trustee, right? Um, in, in New Jersey, um, we recovered all this money um, and then governor Chris Christie said, oh, I got a hole in my budget or put the money in there. 
is put us in natural resources. And um, they passed the constitutional amendment. All the money has to go in. You would have thought that that was the only place it could go. Uh, so there are ways to control uh, a hypothetical bad sovereign. Uh, that's one way. Um, I think many states do have sort of environmental rights statutes that I think I've seen actions in Pennsylvania where the state was sued for not, you know, taking care of business. Um, I don't know the, the structure of their laws all that much. Pennsylvania actually has a, a, a constitutional uh, uh, provision the, uh, you know, that was adopted That's in right. the 70s. Uh, yeah, so that they've actually constitutionalized the public trust doctrine. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and actually, there was there was a decision last year that was pretty, or or a year before on on what you can do with it. Uh, I think it got tested all the way up to Supreme Court or something. I think it was in twenty eighteen. Um, yeah, um, but it, there was other cases before then. I think, uh, um, you know, twenty thirteen there was a, a case. I don't remember maybe Richardson something like that. Um, Justice Castile uh, wrote the uh, the opinion that, that is is pretty widely cited. Um, so we have a question from the audience, which actually got sent to the chat so everyone can read it, but I'll just read it out loud for the video purposes or the recording. What about the conversion of public assets to private equity through utility rates? Is there a public trust claim there? Also, Marx versus Whitney, citizen standing in California for pub public trust claims. So if any of you panelists, you can address that question. I, I didn't understand the First part of it, the the second part. I mean, that that's a leading case on on public trust. But the first part with the rates. Michael, do you want to clarify your question a little bit? Um, maybe he didn't hear me. Oh, I don't see him in here anymore. So I guess if no one, oh, there we go. I see him. Do you want to clarify your question, Michael, or does anybody on the panel sort of know what he's getting out there? Yeah, it's, I think he's asking, could you sue under the public trust doctrine as a citizen um, if your um, public resources are being quote unquote privatized by um, you know, utility charges, things like that. Um, so maybe it's a situation where there's a, a, a private water supplier or something like that. Who's you know? I mean, we have private water suppliers across the country who are provide, taking taking groundwater, which is a public natural resource and a public trust resource, and you know, using it in their their water products. Uh, for example, you know, is it, I think maybe the question is, you know, is that is that allowed, or is that could that be the basis of a claim? I mean, it could be the basis of a takings claim. Um, if it's your uh, resource or your share of a resource, but um, I mean, everything I've read has always linked the public trust to the sovereign as opposed to an individual. Yeah, yeah. I um, mean, I would also think if, if it was, I'm not sure if this is exactly the import of the question, the way I rephrased it, but you know, if that was the, the intent of the question, um, you know, you're also going to have some kind of a delegation or some kind of a, um, a process that it would have went through in order to, to allow that to happen. Um, so I would think that uh, you'd have a, you know, some sort of problem. There'd be a statutory defense, for instance. I, I mean, another way, uh, just going back to the citizen, um, you know, remember Illinois Central, just you know, throw the bums out of office, elect a new administration, and have them undo the taking, you know? Um, that, that would certainly work. I mean, there'd be a lawsuit, but I think the public trust would, would stand with the side of the next administration was trying to, pre you know, protect yeah. it. I think that's really the classic of the public trust doctrine, you know, as opposed to like the, affirm the basis is an affirmative claim. It's more of a, you know, a shield that, you know, you, you, you bring up against the, the, the sword of the sovereign, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think you're right. Professor White, you had your hand up. Yeah, I I 
I think she's froze. Yeah. But, oh. Um, oh, there you go. Okay. Okay, we can, can hear you now. Okay, I'm just going to say a few words, and then I think I have to drop off because my connection has been so unstable. I wanted to just wrap up um, with a couple big thoughts, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, the, the, the first thought is, uh, I forgot, I neglected to clarify, but I think it's important that atmospheric recovery damages are not to pay for offsets for further carbon pollution. That's, that's the, one of the most important things to remember. This is not an offset sort of program. We have to decarbonize completely and do the sky cleanup um, to regain climate stability. The second, um, I want to just leave with a, a sort of some big thoughts on the atmospheric recovery plan. Um, because several panelists noted it's very important to have a tangible plan that a court can order financing of. And this is not, um, natural resource damage suits are not the only ways to finance a regional plan. There's, of course, the voluntary corporate do donations, there's other things, but they might be a very important method. So the Regional Atmospheric Recovery Plan is a very important predecessor, I would think, to any regional natural resource damages uh, lawsuit to fund that plan. And that plan can be jump-started by literally just catalysts in the region, combining scientists with leaders, with stakeholders. And what it does is it first identifies the regional potential. And so this gets at what Alan Canner was saying. New Jersey won't have nearly the potential, for example, as say Oregon or Washington with this huge vast forest to suck down carbon dioxide. And so um, the first the first part of the plan is just identifying what is the region's potential so that some regions don't take more than their fair share of the money. Because, and this gets to what Dan Galpern was saying too. You've got different potential of different countries and different regions within different countries. You don't want the ones positioned to sue to take up all the money from those that are more positioned due to their natural infrastructure to draw down carbon. So that's a really important part of the, the atmospheric recovery plan on the regional level. Also pricing the actual measures, how much would you have to pay farmers to implement these measures or foresters to replant forests? Um, identifying co-benefits and justice issues. It doesn't make sense to plant forests where farms are, where people need uh, food crops. All of these, as well as permanence mechanisms and how you do the accounting. All of these can be defined in this tangible regional planning effort. And a team at University of Oregon is looking into how to develop that process. And we call this NCS Plus. It's Natural Ca uh, Climate Solutions Plus because we're trying to inject the economic and the um, and the community concerns and the justice issues all at once and the legal mechanisms all at once into the planning process. Um, and I guess my final, my final thought is this really just takes catalysts. On a regional level, you can start the planning process. Who are the obvious catalysts? It's tribes, um, states, people in counties, probably not federal agencies right now, but we'll wait and see. Um, and foreign nations. And then where a foreign nation like Brazil has huge capacity to draw down, but maybe not so much capacity to mount a natural resource damage lawsuit, maybe there's a coupling between partners uh, in attorney general's offices in the United States and countries with huge capacity. So you get judgments even in other countries and then domesticate the judgment here in the United States to actually get the funding for that judgment. So there's all sorts of ramifications and possibilities, but the point is it isn't an either or. There could be a, a UN um, solution that, that usually takes a long time, but there can also be these regional solutions. And as long as they are cognizant of the regional limitations on drawdown capacity, then they won't take more of their fair share in concept. It's a rough amalgamation, but that's the principle. So I just want to throw that out and um, say thank you. Um, and I, I will stay on, but my connection was very unstable. So thank you all. Thank you.
Does anyone have any last questions? I know it's been sort of a little longer, so I, I want people to be able to ask questions if they have any that are remaining in the audience. Otherwise, I want people to be able to continue about their busy days too. So last chances for audience questions. I feel like it's been a good panel. I have recorded this, so this will be available for future viewing and listening. And if anyone, any panelist has a, any last thoughts, feel free to jump in right now. Otherwise, I know you are, are all really busy too, so. I just want to say thank you, Callie, and, uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Mims, for uh, brainstorming this. It's uh, very useful and interesting for me, at least. Yeah, well, thank, thank you all. Thank you very much for having me. It was, uh, it was really fun to participate, and including the planning sessions. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so. A big thanks to Callie. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thank you all. This has been great. And um, Callie, how do people? How do people actually? Uh, you know, for those few people who didn't, didn't join us in the world, how do they? <laughs> how do they find the recording? Um, so I'm gonna have to upload it, and I think that I can find a link that is. Um, you can just, it's basically a link that you can go to and watch it. The, it doesn't allow for downloads. So it's sort of just like online. Um, people can view at any point. And as soon as I upload, as soon as I upload the recording, I will share the link with all of the listservs that had RSVP'd for the panel. And you all can feel free to share it with your networks at will. Great, thank you so much. No, thank, thank you, you all. Much. Happy Friday. Stay safe. Take care. Take care. Sure.